Impas erect, quo prima quies mortalibus egris. Tempus erat, quo prima quies mortalibus egris. And so return to work. The MA gown, alphas and betas, central heating, floor polish, Demosthenes on the crown, and Oedipus at Colonus. And I think of the beginnings of other terms coming across the sea to unknown England, and memory reaffirms that alarm and exhilaration of arrival. White wooden boxes, clatter of boots, a smell of changing rooms, lifebuoy soap and muddy flannels, and over all a bell dragooning us to dormitory or classroom, ringing with a tongue of frost across the bare benches and desks escutcheoned with initials, we sat on hot pipes by the wall, aware of the cold in our bones and the noise and the bell impending. A fishtail gas flare in the dark latrine, chalk and ink and rows of pegs and lockers. The war was on, maize and margarine and lessons on the map of Flanders. But we had our toys, our electric torches, our glass, dogs and cats and plasticine and conkers, and we had our games. We learned to dribble and pass in jerseys striped like tigers. And we had our make-believe. We had our mock freedom in walks by twos and threes on Sunday. We dug out fossils from the yellow rock or drank the dorset distance. And we had our little tiptoe minds, alert to jump for facts and fancies and statistics, and our little jokes of Billy Bunter dirt and a heap of homemade dogma. The abbey chimes varnished the yellow street. The water from the taps in the bath was yellow. The trees were full of owls. The sweets were sweet and life an expanding ladder. And reading romances, we longed to be grown up, to shoot from the hip and marry lovely ladies and smoke cigars and live on claret cup and lie in bed in the morning taking it for granted that things would still get better and bigger and better and bigger and better, that the road across the hill led to the Garden of Eden. Everything to expect and nothing to deplore. Cushy days beyond the dumb horizon and nothing to doubt about to linger for in the halfway house of childhood. And certainly we did not linger. We went on growing and growing, gluttons for the future, and four foot six was gone, and we found it was time to be leaving, to be changing school. Sandstone changed for chalk and ammonites for the flinty husks of sponges, another lingo to talk, and jerseys in other colours. And still the acquiring of unrelated facts, a string of military dates for history, and the Gospels, and the Acts, and logarithms, and Greek, and the essays of Elia, and still the exhilarating rhythm of free movement, swimming or serving at tennis, the five courts tattling repartee or rain on the sweating body. But life began to narrow to what was done, a dominant gerundive, and number two must mimic number one in bearing, swearing, attitude and accent. And so we jettisoned all our childish fantasies and anarchism, the weak must go to the wall, but strength implies the system. You must lose your soul to be strong. You cannot stand alone on your own legs or your own ideas. The order of the day is complete conformity and an automatic complacence. Such was the order of the day. Only at times the fool among the yes-men flashed his motley to prick their pseudo-reason with his rhymes and drop his grain of salt on court behaviour. And sometimes a whisper in books would challenge the code, or a censored memory, sometimes. Sometimes the explosion of rooks. Sometimes the mere batter of light on the senses. And the critic, jailed in the mind, would peep through the grate and husky from long silence, murmur gently that there is something rotten in the state of Denmark. But the state is not the whole of Denmark, and a spade is still a spade, and the difference is not final between a tailored suit and a ready-made, and knowledge is not necessarily wisdom. 
and a cultured accent alone will not provide a season ticket to the Vita Nuova, and there are many better men outside than ever answered roll call. But the critic did not win, has not won yet, though always reminding us of points forgotten. We hasten to forget as much as he remembers. And school was what they always said it was, an apprenticeship to life, an initiation, and all the better because the initiates were blindfold. The reflex action of a dog or sheep being enough for normal avocations and life rotating in an office sleep as long as things are normal. Which it was assumed they would always be. On that assumption, terms began and ended. And now, in 1938 AD, term is again beginning. The light of civilized progress, with its tolerances and cooperation, with its dignities and joys, has often been blotted out. But I hold the belief that we have now at last got far enough ahead of barbarism to control it and to avert it, if only we realize what is afoot. But work is alien. What do I care for the master of those who know, of those who know too much? I am too harassed by my familiar devils, by those I cannot see, by those I may not touch. Knowing perfectly well in the mind, on paper, how wistful and absurd are personal fixations, but yet the pulse keeps thrumming and her voice is faintly heard through walls and walls of indifference and abstraction and across the London roofs and every so often calls up hopes from nowhere, a distant clatter of hooves, and my common sense denies she is returning and says, if she does return, she will not stay. And my pride, in the name of reason, tells me to cut my losses and call it a day, which, if I had the cowardice of my convictions, I certainly should do, but doubt still finds a loophole to gamble on another rendezvous. And I try to feel her in fancy, but the fancy dissolves in curls of mist. And I try to summarise her, but how can hungry love be a proper analyst? For suddenly I hate her and would murder her memory if I could, and then of a sudden I see her sleeping gently inaccessible in a sleeping wood, with thorns and thorns around her, and the cries of night, and I have no knife or axe to hack my passage back to the lost delight. And then I think of the others, and jealousy riots in impossible schemes, to kill them with all the machinery of fact and with all the tortures of dreams. But yet, my dear... If only for my own distraction, I have to try to assess your beauty of body, your paradoxes of spirit, even your taste in dress, whose emotions are an intricate dialectic, whose eagerness to live a many-sided life might be deplored as fickle, unpractical, or merely inquisitive. A superficial comment, for your instinct sanctions all you do, who know that truth is nothing in abstraction, that action makes both wish and principle come true, whose changes have the logic of a prism, whose moods create, who never linger haggling on the threshold to weigh the pros and cons until it is too late. At times intractable, virulent, hypercritical, with bitter tongue, overshy at times, morose, defeatist, at times a token that the world is young, given to overstatement, careless of caution, quick to sound the chimes of delicate intuition, at times malicious and generous at times, whose kaleidoscopic ways are all authentic, whose truth is not of a statement but of a dance, 
so that even when you deceive, your deceits are merely technical and of no significance. And so, when I think of you, I have to meet you in thought on your own ground. To apply to you my algebraic canons would merely be unsound, and, having granted this, I cannot balance my hopes or fears of you in pros and cons. It has been proved that Achilles cannot catch the tortoise. It has been proved that men are automatons. Everything wrong has been proved. I will not bother any more with proof. I see the future glinting with your presence, like moon on a slate roof, and my spirits rise again. It is October, the year God dying on the destined pyre, with all the colours of a scrambled sunset and the funeral elegance of fire in the grey world to lie cocooned but shaping his gradual return. No one can stop the cycle. The grit is full of ash, but fire will always burn. Therefore, listening to the taxis in which you never come, so regularly pass, I wait, content, banking on the spring and watching the dead leaves canter over the dirty grass. I have been out in the zones being occupied through the Czech troops moving back as they evacuate. Prague itself is very quiet. The people talk a great deal, solemnly, quietly, rather reservedly about what has happened to them and what is happening to their country. And there are some extra police about. And there are refugees up in the big stadium on the hill above the left bank of the river. These days are misty, insulated, mute like a faded tapestry and the soft pedal is down, and the yellow leaves are falling down, and we hardly have the heart to meddle any more with personal ethics or public calls. People have not recovered from the crisis. Their faces are far away. The tone of the words belies their thesis. For they say that now it is time unequivocally to act, to let the pawns be taken, that criticism, a virtue previously, now can only weaken, and that when we go to Rome we must do as the Romans do, cry out together for bread and circuses, put on your togas now, for this is Roman weather. Circuses of death, and from the topmost tears a cataract of goggling, roaring faces. On the arena sand, those who are about to die try out their paces. Now it is night. A cold mist creeps, the night is still and damp and lonely. Sitting by the fire, it is hard to realise that the legions wait at the gates and that there is only a little time for rest, though not by rights for rest, rather for wetting the will, for calculating and compromise between necessity and wish, apprenticed late to learn the trade of hating. Remember the sergeant barking at bayonet practice when you were small. To kill a dummy, you must act a dummy, or you cut no ice at all. Now it is morning again, the 25th of October. In a white fog, the cars have yellow lights. The chill creeps up the wrists, the sun is sallow, the silent hours grow down like stalactites. And reading Plato talking about his forms, to damn the artist touting round his mirror, I am glad that I have been left the third best bed and live in a world of error. His world of capital initials, of transcendent ideas, is too bleak. For me, there remain, to all intents and purposes, seven days in the week, and no one Tuesday is another, and you destroy it if you subtract the difference and relate it merely to the form of Tuesday. This is Tuesday, the 25th of October, 1938. Aristotle was better, who watched the insect breed, the natural world develop, stressing the function, scrapping the form in itself, taking the horse from the shelf and letting it gallop. Education gives us too many labels and cliches, cuts too many Gordian knots, trains us to keep the roads nor reconnoiter any of the beauty spots or danger spots. Not that I would rather be a peasant, 
the happy peasant, like the noble savage, is a myth. I do not envy the self-possession of an elm tree, nor the aplomb of a granite monolith. All that I would like to be is human, having a share in a civilised, articulate and well-adjusted community where the mind is given its due, but the body is not distrusted. As it is, the so-called humane studies may lead to cushy jobs, but leave the men who land them spiritually bankrupt intellectual snobs. Not but what I am glad to have my comforts, better authentic mammon than a bogus god. If it were not for lit hum, I might be climbing a ladder with a hod. And seven hundred a year will pay the rent and the gas and the phone and the grocer. The emperor takes his seat beneath the awning. Those who are about to die. Come, pull the curtains closer. The Fascist Grand Council ended its meeting at Rome in the early hours of this morning. In a communique issued afterwards, the Council sent a message of goodwill to Japan after the victories at Canton and Hankow. It was also announced that Libya will have its status changed so that its four provinces become part of the national territory. Which things being so? As we said when we studied the classics, I ought to be glad that I studied the classics at Marlborough and Merton, not everyone here having had the privilege of learning a language that is incontrovertibly dead, and of carting a toy box of hallmarked memorial phrases around in his head. We wrote compositions in Greek which they said was a lesson in logic and good for the brain. We marched, countermarched to the field marshal's blue pencil baton, we dressed by the right, and we wrote out the sentence again. We learned that a gentleman never misplaces his accents, that nobody knows how to speak, much less how to write English who is not hobnobbed with the great grandparents of English, that the boy on the modern side is merely a parasite, but the classical student is bred to the purple. His training in syntax is also a training in thought and even in morals. If called to the bar or the barracks, he always will do what he ought. And knowledge, besides, should be prized for the sake of knowledge. Oxford crowded the mantelpiece with gods. Scaliger, Heinsius, Dindorf, Bentley and Vilamovitz, as we learned our genuflections for honour mods. And then they taught us philosophy logic and metaphysics, the negative judgment and the ding and sick. And every single thinker was as powerful as Napoleon and crafty as Metternich. And it really was very attractive to be able to talk about tables and to ask if the table is, and to draw the cork out of an old conundrum and watch the paradoxes fizz. And it made one confident to think that nothing really was what it seemed under the sun, that the actual was not real, and the real was not with us, and all that mattered was the one. And they said, The man in the street is so naive, he never can see the wood for the trees. He thinks he knows he sees a thing, but cannot tell you how he knows the thing he thinks he sees. And oh, how much I liked the concrete universal. I never thought that I should be telling them, vice versa, that they can't see the trees for the wood. But certainly it was fun while it lasted, and I got my honours degree and was stamped as a person of intelligence and culture. For ever, wherever, two or three persons of intelligence and culture are gathered together in talk, writing definitions on invisible blackboards in non-existent chalk. But such sacramental occasions are nowadays comparatively rare. There is always a wife, or a boss, or a dun, or a client disturbing the air. Barbarians always, life in the particular always, dozens of men in the street, and the perennial, if unimportant, problem of getting enough to eat. So blow the bugles over the metaphysicians, let the pure mind return to the pure mind. I must be content to remain in the world of appearance, and sit on the mere appearance 
of a behind. But in case you should think my education was wasted, I hasten to explain that having once been to the University of Oxford, you can never really again believe anything that anyone says, and that, of course, is an asset in a world like ours. Why bother to water a garden that is planted with paper flowers? Oh, the freedom of the press, the late-night final, tomorrow's pulp. One should not gulp one's port, but as it isn't poured, I'll gulp it if I want to gulp, but probably I'll just enjoy the colour and pour it down the sink, for I don't call advertisement a statement or any quack medicine a drink. Goodbye now, Plato and Hegel. The shop is closing down. They don't want any philosopher kings in England. There ain't no universals in this man's town. Blown around the world in a plane. I set a revolution in Spain. And the North Pole I have charted. Still, I can't get started with you. The next day, I drove by night among red and amber and green. Spears and candles, corkscrews and slivers of reflected light in the mirror of the rainy asphalt, along the North Circular and the Great West Roads, running the gauntlet of impoverished fancy, where housewives bolster up their jerry-built abodes with amour propre and the habit of higher purchase. The wheels wished in the wet, the flashy strings of neon lights unraveled, the windscreen wiper kept at its job like a tiger in a cage or a cricket that sings all night through for nothing. Factory, a site for a factory, rubbish dumps, bungalows in lath and plaster, in brick, in concrete, and shining semicircles of petrol pumps like intransigent gangs of idols. And the road swings round my head like a lasso, looping wider and wider tracts of darkness. And the country succeeds the town, and the country too is damp and dark and evil. And coming over the chilterns, the dead leaves leap, charging the windscreen like a barrage of angry birds as I take the steep plunge to Henley or Hades. And at the curves of the road, the telephone wires shine like strands of silk, and the hedge solicits my irresponsible tires to an accident, to a bed in the wet grasses. And in quiet, crooked streets, only the village pub spills a golden puddle over the pavement, and trees bend down and rub unopened dormer windows with their knuckles. Nettlebed, Shillingford, Dorchester, each on roads, the road to Oxford. Kelly's affair tomorrow, driving voters to the polls in that home of lost illusions. And what am I doing it for? Mainly for fun. Partly for a half-believed-in principle. A core of fact in a pulp of verbiage. Remembering that this crude and so-called obsolete, top-heavy, tedious parliamentary system is our only ready weapon to defeat the legion's eagles and the lictor's axes. And remembering that those who by their habit hate politics can no longer keep their private values unless they open the public gate to a better political system. That Rome was not built in a day is no excuse for lazy fare, for bowing to the odds against us. What is the use of asking what is the use of one brick only? The perfectionist stands forever in a fog, waiting for the fog to clear. Better to be vulgar and use your legs and leave a blank for Hogg and put a cross for Lindsay. There are only too many who say, what difference does it make one way or the other? To turn the stream of history will take more than a by-election. So Thursday came, and Oxford went to the polls, and made its coward vote, and the streets resounded to the triumphant cheers of the lost souls, the profiteers, the dunderheads, the smarties. 
and I drove back to London in the dark of the morning. The trees standing out in the headlights cut from cardboard, wondering which disease is worse, the status quo or the mere utopia. For from now on, each occasion must be used, however trivial, to rally the ranks of those whose chance will soon be gone for even guerrilla warfare. The nicest people in England have always been the least apt to solidarity or alignment, but all of them must now align against the beast that prowls at every door and barks in every headline. Dawn and London and daylight and last the sun. I stop the car and take the yellow placard off the bonnet. That little job is done, though without success or glory. The plane tree leaves come sidling down. Catch my guineas, catch my guineas. And the sun caresses Camden Town, the barrows of oranges and apples. broadcast a reminder on the proper way to take care of the gas masks that have been distributed and a warning against such strange misuses as testing the masks in gas ovens and by the exhaust pipes of motor cars. Shelley and jazz and leader and love and hymn tunes and day returns too soon. We'll get drunk among the roses in the valley of the moon. Give me an aphrodisiac. Give me lotus, give me the same again. Make all the erotic poets of Rome and Ionia and Florence and Provence and Spain pay a tithe of their sugar to my potion and ferment my days with the twang of Hawaii and the boom of the Congo. Let the old muse loosen her stays or give me a new muse with stockings and suspenders and a smile like a cat with false eyelashes and fingernails of carmine and dressed by Skia Pirelli with a pillbox hat. Let the aces run riot round Brooklands. Let the tape machines go drunk. Turn on the purple spotlight. Pull out the Vox Humana. Dig up somebody's body in a cloakroom trunk. Give us sensations. And then again, sensations. Strip tease. Fireworks. All in wrestling. Gin. Spend your capital, open your house and pawn your padlocks. Let the critical sense go out and the roaring boys come in. Give me a hurry, but hurries are too easy. Give me a nun. We'll rip the angels off the golden reardos before we're done. Tiger women and lesbos. Drums and entrails. And let the skies rotate. We'll play roulette with the stars. We'll sit out drinking at the hangman's gate. Oh, look who comes here. I cannot see their faces walking in file, slowly in file. They have no shoes on their feet. The knobs of their ankles catch the moonlight as they pass the stile and cross the moor among the skeletons of bog oak, following the track from the gallows back to town. Each has the end of a rope around his neck. I wonder who let these men come back. Who cut them down? And now they reach the gate and line up opposite the neon lights on the medieval wall and underneath the sky signs each one takes his cowl and lets it fall. And we see their faces, each the same as the other, men and women, each like a closed door. Door. Something about their faces is familiar. Where have we seen them before? Was it the murderer on the nursery ceiling? Or Judas Iscariot in the field of blood? Or someone at Gallipoli or in Flanders, caught in the end all mud? But take no notice of them. Out with the ukulele, the saxophone and the dice. They are sure to go away if we take no notice. Another round of drinks or make it twice. That was a good one. Tell us another. Don't stop talking. Cap your stories. If you haven't any new ones, tell us the old ones. Tell 
tell them as often as you like, and perhaps those horrible, stiff people with blank faces that are yet familiar won't be there when you look again. But don't look just yet. Just give them time to vanish. I said to vanish. What do you mean? They won't. Give us the songs of Harlem or of Mytilene, pearls and wine. There can't be a hell unless there is a heaven, and a devil would have to be divine, and there can't be such things one way or the other. That we know. You can't step in the same river twice, so there can't be ghosts. Thank God that rivers always flow. Sufficient to the moment is the moment. Past and future merely don't make sense, and yet I thought I had seen them. But how, if there is only a present tense? Come on, boys, we aren't afraid of bogies. Give us another drink. This little lady has a fetish. She goes to bed in mink. This little pig went to market. Now, I think you may look. I think the coast is clear. Well, why don't you answer? I can't answer because they are still there. Nightmare leaves fatigue. We envy men of action who sleep and wake, murder and intrigue, without being doubtful, without being haunted. And I envy the intransigence of my own countrymen who shoot to kill and never see the victim's face become their own or find his motive sabotage their motives. So reading the memoirs of Maud Gone, daughter of an English mother and a soldier father, I note how a single purpose can be founded on a jumble of opposites. Dublin Castle, the Viceregal Ball, the embassies of Europe, hatred scribbled on a wall, jails and revolvers. And I remember, when I was little, the fear bandied among the servants that casement would land at the pier with a sword and a horde of rebels, and how we used to expect at a later date, when the wind blew from the west, the noise of shooting starting in the evening at eight in Belfast in the York Street district, and the voodoo of the orange bands drawing an iron net through darkest Ulster, flailing the limbo lands, the linen mills, the long wet grass, the ragged hawthorn, and one red black with the other red white, his hope the other man's damnation. Up the rebels, to hell with the Pope, and God save, as you prefer, the King or Ireland. The land of scholars and saints, scholars and saints, my eye. The land of ambush, purblind manifestos, never-ending complaints, the born martyr and the gallant ninny, the grocer drunk with the drum, the landowner shot in his bed, the angry voices piercing the broken fanlight in the slum, the shawled woman weeping at the garish altar. Kathleen Nahulan. Why must a country, like a ship or a car, be always female, mother, or sweetheart? A woman passing by, we did but see her passing passing like a patch of sun on the rainy hill, and yet we love her forever and hate our neighbour, and each one in his will binds his heirs to continuance of hatred. Drums in the haycock, drums in the harvest, black drums in the night shaking the windows, King William is riding his white horse back to the boyne on a banner. Thousands of banners, thousands of white horses, thousands of Williams waving thousands of swords and ready to fight till the blue sea turns to orange. Such was my country, and I thought I was well out of it, educated and domiciled in England, though yet her name keeps ringing like a bell in an underwater belfry. Why do we like being Irish? 
partly because it gives us a hold on the sentimental English as members of a world that never was, baptised with fairy water, and partly because Ireland is small enough to be still thought of with a family feeling, and because the waves are rough that splitter from a more commercial culture, and because one feels that here, at least, one can do local work which is not at the world's mercy, and that on this tiny stage, with luck, a man might see the end of one particular action. It is self-deception, of course. There is no immunity in this island either. A cart that is drawn by somebody else's horse and carrying goods to somebody else's market, the bombs in the turnip sack, the sniper from the roof, Griffith, Conley, Collins, where have they brought us? Ourselves alone? Let the round tower stand aloof in a world of bursting mortar. Let the school children fumble their sums in a half-dead language. Let the censor be busy on the books, pull down the Georgian slums. Let the games be played in Gaelic. Let them grow beet sugar, let them build a factory in every hamlet, let them pigeonhole the souls of the killed into sheep and goats, patriots and traitors. And the North, where I was a boy, is still the North, veneered with the grime of Glasgow, thousands of men whom nobody will employ, standing at the corners, coughing. And the street children play on the wet pavement, hopscotch or marbles, and each rich family boasts a sagging tennis net on a spongy lawn beside a dripping shrubbery. The smoking chimneys hint at prosperity round the corner, but they make their Ulster linen from foreign lint, and the money that comes in goes out to make more money. A city built on mud, a culture built upon profit, free speech nipped in the bud, the minority always guilty. Why should I want to go back to you, Ireland, my Ireland? The blots on the page are so black that they cannot be covered with shamrock. I hate your grandiose airs, your sob stuff, your laugh and your swagger, your assumption that everyone cares who is the king of your castle. Castles are out of date. The tide flows round the children's sandy fancy. Put up what flag you like, it is too late to save your soul with bunting. Odi atque amo. Shall we cut this name on trees with a rusty dagger? Her mountains are still blue, her rivers flow, bubbling over the boulders. She is both a bore and a bitch. Better close the horizon, send her no more fantasy, no more longings which are under a fatal tariff. For common sense is the vogue, and she gives her children neither sense nor money, who slouch around the world with a gesture and a brogue and a faggot of useless memories.